people should get out of the habit of, of using their cell phone, unless, you know, if the baby, babies don't need to be, we don't have to be, you know, 24 seven, when they're doing their own thing, you really want to encourage that. But what you do need to be doing is when they are kind of bidding for your attention, they're wanting to engage. There's really nothing you can do that is more important for the well being of your child than to engage. We've got this very strong bias towards schooling in our society. We think the way people develop is we send them off to big single you know age segregated buildings run by professionals. That's what we think. And we send our children there so they can develop well. That is a flawed idea. But it really is just absurd to say that we can't as a society make it possible for parents who want to to spend more time raising their own young children because of the economy. Good morning, Catherine. Good morning, Tammy. What I read was that you're part of a, or even maybe you set it up, I don't know, Center for Child and Family Policy. Did you set that up? Yes. Okay. I founded the Center on Child and Family Policy. We launched just over a year ago. Ah, congratulations. So Thank you. Um, this is a think tank, a national think tank, focused on specifically on early childhood. And, you know, I'm very interested in that. I have grandchildren now. So my kids are grown and that all went, you know, as well as it goes. It's They're good kids. They're good kids and they're responsible citizens, I'd say. Mm -hmm. But now they have little kids and I'm really concerned about the education system, obviously. But their kids are between one and six. Oh, and I just had a new one. So zero and six. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I have four grandkids. And so now I'm, I'm back thinking about the wealth, the good welfare of our children. And, and so I know that I've watched a little bit of what you do. You're very concerned about the welfare of our children. And so that's why I invited you to speak with me today. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, first of all, maybe you could, uh, tell our audience, about this think tank and what your mission is. Sure, yes. Uh, prior to founding the Center on Child and Family Policy, I spent six years at the American Enterprise Institute. I uh, started um, as their first research scholar in early childhood through a program, uh, a new position that was funded by the Kellogg Foundation. Um, the, the American Enterprise Institute is right-leaning. The Kellogg Foundation is uh, quite left-leaning, so it, people find that kind of peculiar. The motivation behind the grant was the Kellogg Foundation was uh, wanting to um, broaden the kind of engagement in the field of early childhood, which has conventionally been a much greater focus on the left. Mm -hmm. So the Kellogg Foundation gave this grant to the American Enterprise Institute. I was hired and ended up staying for, for six years and was successful in building uh, AEI's early childhood program um, focused on primarily on communicating with conservatives and about early childhood and also uh, trying to bridge, um, kind of bridge gaps between the left and the right around early childhood. And bridging any gaps these days is very difficult. Uh, but if there's any area of policy that that we 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 in theory could do that, and we certainly need to try, it's in this in this area. So, I decided to found the Center on Early Childhood Policy to continue the work that I was doing at AEI um, on, on, on a kind of a, on, but, but create a platform that's focused specifically on child and family policy. Um, the reason that the, the name of the center is the Center on Child and Family Policy is because th for young children, um, um, particularly infants and toddlers, as you know, there's no such thing as family well-being without child well-being and no such certainly no such thing as child well-being without family well-being they're the same thing mm 
-hmm. So for a 10 year old, you can have policies that, that, uh, that are focused on advancing the well being of a 10 year old that are in fact separate from the family and vice versa. But with very young children, that just doesn't make any sense. And so this, this, this distinction that we've kind of made in policy uh, 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 for early childhood policy on the one hand and family policy on the other hand, that's really an, not a useful um, distinction in early childhood. And yet part, it, part of uh, the reason I, I feel that we've maintained that distinction is because the left has tended to focus on early childhood. The right has tended to focus on family policy Mm -hmm. And you just can't you just can't separate them. So it is telling that the um, the name of the center center on child and, or at the center on, on child and family policy, the URL center on child and family policy dot org was available in 2021 when I started this. How can that be available? Right. That seems <laughs> as though someone would have got that a long time ago. So that just underscores how these mm -hmm. fields have been developed. So d divided. So that's really a primary focus is, 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 is helping people understand that you don't have child well-being without family well-being and then helping people understand what that means to ensure that young children can thrive. Right. And so early development, uh, early developments between one and three or zero and three. Well, or, really between um, f from the prenatal period to age three has been well established as the most crucial f um, period of human development. It really lays from conception, that period just lays the foundation for uh, for for um, well-being throughout the lifespan in really every dimension. And there's there there's been a kind of an explosion of research over the last 10, 20 years in general about the prenatal to three period. Um, in particular, researchers are now understanding that the great impact that the prenatal period has on children's outcomes, uh, not just health outcomes, but um, cognitive outcomes and further we have we've for quite a long time been focused on women's health physical health during the prenatal period what researchers are now understanding is that um, ex, um, high levels of sustained uh, anxiety and depression during the prenatal period also has a detrimental effect on young hmm. children on the mother on the on the mother but on yeah. on her baby right that there are observable changes, observable effects on a newborn baby of mothers who've had sustained stress, um, anxiety, and depression. I mean, I don't mean getting stuck in a traffic jam or being upset because your husband didn't take the garbage out, right? I mean, um, y women who are um, in, in, maybe alone, in, pover in poverty, dealing with an abusive partner, that kind of thing. Right. Um, right. Chronic. 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 That's a good that, Thank you, Tammy. That's <laughs> You're exactly welcome. The, that's exactly <laughs> the right word. Yes. And then the period. So that period, which we really have not been focused as much on and we need to focus more on it. Um, and then the infant um, period of infancy and toddlerhood, which lays the foundation for lifelong development and is um, almost entirely dependent on the uh, nurturing care of adults in the child's environment. And when those adults, for whatever reason, are not able to provide that kind of nurturing care to young children, um, it's been pretty clearly established that has detrimental effects on a child's development. So then was the policy partly set up for people who are from uh, Children who are from disadvantaged families. The my the center on child and family policy. My center, we are primarily folk. I would say that that we're 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 more focused on um on dis on fam on children from disadvantaged children and families because those are the ones that are 
are most relevant to policy. They're the ones who need um, help. Yep. Um, for more wealthier families, there's a lot of evidence, as you know, that that our children are not doing well. Hmm. Um, not girls, not right. not boys, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's the mental health, emotional well-being of children is in what many are are describing as a crisis state. We don't know what all the causes for that are. Uh, however, one thing that that people don't understand um, that I think at all income levels is having a detrimental effect on children is how crucial a nurturing, responsive, ongoing interactions are with young children. Okay. When you say nurturing, what do you mean by that? Um, well, the basics are obviously that you are when a, you're when a baby's hungry, you're feeding the baby when the baby's crying or 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 has some sort of you know something's hurting the baby. Um, you are are resolving that. But mm -hmm. what really drives language development, um, uh, cognitive, emo social, and emotional development more, more broadly? are those kinds of back and forth interactions mm -hmm. with children. So uh, that you know that most many people do automatically, you know them when you see them um, with a tiny baby. It, when the baby says, okay. and you, you know, t are kind of responding and talking back, what research has shown that, that when babies, for example, point to something, you know, they'll kind of wave their arm Mm -hmm. And that when adults look at the thing that the baby is focused on, um, now, you know, you'll, when you think of it, you'll realize you do, you've been doing this. You did this with your children. You certainly do it with your grandchildren. And you, and you kind of look at the same thing and you make a comment or you just acknowledge where the baby's attention is. Um, those kinds of back and forth reactions that are responsive to kind of where the baby's at, you know, mm -hmm. you know, this does not need to be 24 seven at all. Um, but it needs to be, it, but it needs to be sort of, you know, continual, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, so, so, um, so one, there's a really interesting, um, so I would point your listeners to, there's a really amazing body of research um, on what's called a still face experiment, where I, I don't know if you you've 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 I seen this. It. it was it was done years ago, I believe at Harvard initially, and many people have replicated it. Where there's a baby and a mother, they've done them with fathers, with with other you know trusted loved um, caretakers, and the baby is interacting with the the the, the parent, and then and the baby is doing what babies do, just waving their there's nothing that babies <laughs> like more they just they just they just start wiggling all over when someone is interacting with them with their eyes right and we now know that much much more is going on than we used to understand and then the researcher cues the parent and the parent turns away and then turns back with no emotion so you didn't even like that <laughs> <laughs> Like a stone face. Mm -hmm. And no matter what the baby does, the oh. face just stays the same. Yeah. And I will send you these videos. It is extraordinary. These babies go into meltdown quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quickly. And they have different reactions depending on their different personalities. Some of them just get really frantic and just start crying. They get mad. Some of them just get kind of depressed, right? Mm -hmm. There is a fascinating, I've seen one of these, I've heard there more, replication of the still face experiment that a mother did in Australia where her baby was in front of her and she was interacting. And then this was, she was acting this out. She had a friend, her phone beeped. And she picked up her phone and she went like this. <laughs> right, right, right. Mm. And the baby, now from her point of view, this is like two seconds, right? Just give me two seconds, right? But we all know it can go on a lot longer than two seconds. And from the baby's point of view, it is absolutely identical. Oh, wow. And so this is something that's just absolutely driving me crazy when I am out and I see 
a baby in a stroller and a, a, a parent or even a nanny person like this with their phone, we need to understand what, how that feels mm. to mm -hmm. Well, you know, if my, if my husband's on the phone and we're sitting together, I feel the same rejection. Really? We do. We all yeah. do. And, and our brains are not being actively, rapidly shaped by the experience. No, no. Right? That's right. So, so this is what I would say. I mean, I would, so for, for, for wealthier parents, um, they don't suffer from the kind of, um, material, um, d deprivation, sort of uncertainty of do we have enough money to pay the bills? Are we going to be kicked out of our of our rental? They don't have those kinds of stresses, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And those stresses can preoccupy a parent where they're just not engaging with their with their baby. Yeah. Um, with wealthier parents, I think it is more likely to be cell phones. Absolutely, and 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 we don't know. It really hasn't been studied. Oh, yet. that's fascinating. Yes, that's fascinating. Everybody should be paying attention to that right away. Like, oh, let's see, what am I doing? Like, no where is that phone when I'm with my baby? No cell phones when you're <laughs> with your baby. People have told me people find that even pets don't like cell phones. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. So yeah. that's an experiment people can do, right? But or notice with their own pet. But you know, pets can survive. We have pets. We can use our cell phones with our pets. But really, people should get out of the habit of of using their cell phone. Unless you know, if the baby babies don't need to be, we don't have to be, you know, twenty four seven. Um, so the baby babies also need to be doing independent things, you know, lying there, playing with things. They can spend hours just sort of look, not hours, but like quite a long period of time just sort of yeah, grabbing yeah. their own foot and looking at it, right? Yes, yes, and you all don't day. Yeah. That's right. And mm -hmm. you don't want to interrupt their own stuff. You don't always want to be in their face. Mm -hmm. You want to let, the, when they're doing their own thing, you really want to encourage that. But what you do need to be doing is when they are kind of bidding for your attention, they're wanting to engage. There's really nothing you can do that is more important for the well-being of your child than to engage. Right. To put down your phone or take, look away from your computer and... Yes. You know, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That, that's quite... That's fascinating. So the primary aims you say here are of early childhood policy must be strengthened to strengthen families, to support good parenting and improve early health from the prenatal period on. So this pol these policies, it's not about education exactly. No? No. And this is my thought on this. Um, we do, in fact, when we talk about or think, when, you, when, when, when I say I work in early childhood, Mm -hmm. um, I've now been in this field for, what is it, not nine years. Um, people assume that I mean, quote, early childhood education, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. pre-K, Head Start. Now people think maybe childcare, but basically school-like environments. And my thought on this, Tammy, is that Really, since the 1960s, um, our, our society has been putting a ever greater focus on schooling as our human development strategy. Mm -hmm. It was prior, it was it, the, the, the current emphasis on, on public schooling, particularly for more disadvantaged kids, was really a war on poverty emphasis. Um, President Johnson was the first to say that the public schools will be the path to uh, to upward mobility. That wasn't an idea that was really a, a, prime, a major focus prior to that. Um, and along with that came increasing federal money, increasing state money, now states are spending between a third and a half of their entire budgets on public on public schools. Right. So their monthly budget 
is half education. Yeah, a third yeah. to a half. Yeah, exactly. Of all the yeah. tax, right, exactly. They are they are way bought into this, right? Or they, 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 even if even if states wanted to kind of take a step back and rethink this massive investment in schooling, they it, it's going to be very difficult to do. So we spend a lot of time trying to reform it. But the fact of the matter is that if you think of, as I think over, over history, it's been more thought of, if you think of education as human development, schooling is is can be a very important part, but it is just one fairly narrow part of human development mm -hmm. for older children. And as we know, it is not working well for a lot of them. No. With younger children, schooling makes no sense as a way of thinking of human development. No sense. No sense. No sense for infants and toddlers, um, for, th for, Three-year-olds, I, I, our, our borderline four-year-olds, I did teach in preschool. I taught with four-year-olds. Four-year-olds mm -hmm. do, some of them, not all of them, like to spend time in groups of four-year-olds. They like to play with other four-year-olds. That is, that is, that is, uh, three-year-olds are not even at a developmental point where the younger threes aren't even at a developmental point where they play much together. Infants are there any kids? Are there any kids dependent on their personalities that do? It, it, it varies, but just developmentally, there is no such thing as a baby that that benefits developmentally from hanging out with other babies. <laughs> that's just not how, right. that's just not, that's just not how we are. And so, but here's what's happened. We have put in our society, we've put so much emphasis on schooling as our human development strategy. Now that we're understanding that these early years are so much more important than we had previously been realizing, we're thinking that means we have to make schooling earlier and earlier. Right. It, we now know early development is important and we're automatically thinking that means early schooling. And hmm. that's, that. It, and that's, so oops. that's, oops, <laughs> right, exactly, oops. That's a big enough a mistake in the, in the older years, people cannot develop via schooling. That's, that's not, that's, that, that it can be a part of it, but our reliance on schooling is causing a lot of problems for older kids. And with younger kids, it's, it is, it is actually, it is, um, it is, it's just nonsensical. So, um, so part of what I have been focused on is, 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 is if you want to advance the well-being of 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 very young children particularly infants and toddlers you don't do that by increasing school or improving school you do that meaning expanding child care and and increasing its quality that can't be your first area of focus. Your first area of focus has to be what research is just unequivocal has just, has just shown clearly, which is that families are what matter to the well-being of young children. Now, if a parent uh, there there's a there has been a there was a universal child care um, program that was start that was launched in Canada a number of years ago. And there's been a couple of decades ago, there's been a lot of research on that. What they have shown is that for children who come from disadvantaged families and particularly single parent disadvantaged families, mm -hmm. on average, do benefit from high quality childcare. And the key here is th the effect of childcare or pre K or Head Start is going to be determined by the quality of that relative to the alternative. Mm -hmm. And so there's nothing inherently valuable for a young child about going to a non-parental group environment. There's nothing inherently valuable about that. For most young children, their own home is the best early learning environment. If that home is 
for whatever reason, not able to provide what the young child needs mm -hmm. in along the lines of what I've been talking to, sort of engaging and talking. And then when kids get older, you know, they go, they look at a truck and you say, oh, that's a big truck. What color is that truck? You know, those kinds of learning big and small and red and blue, those kinds of things, if a family, if that's not able to happen in a home, in a loving kind of supportive context, then high quality childcare will 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 be um, will be helpful to to a child, but mm -hmm. it's it's a it, it's 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 not it's we can't think about it as it is something that is good for all children. And so when you things, say it, so when you say it's not helpful, what do you mean by not helpful? Well, what I mean is that um, there's there's nothing unique. There, we have, there's, it's not been shown that there's anything uniquely beneficial to a child with a good, you know, decent home environment of being in group non-parental care. In other words, it doesn't add anything. So, um, so what, so why do we do it then? We do it because we have, because our society. I think we do it. Well, mm -hmm. there's two reasons I think we do it. One reason is what I've been saying, which is that we've got this very strong bias towards schooling in our society. We think the way people develop is we send them off to big, single, you know, age segregated buildings run by professionals. That's what we think, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we just replicate that. It's going to be a building. It's going to be age segregated. It's going to be run by professionals. And we send our children there so they can develop well. That is a flawed idea. That How long have we been doing that for? Because it used to be multi. It used to be, uh, you know, be between grade one and grade six. Maybe they were all together. Exactly. So, well, the, this so the this 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 current emphasis on public schooling, as I was saying, as um, um, it, kind of our our primary human development strategy, our primary strategy for breaking um, the, you know, breaking intergenerational poverty and advancing mobility, that dates to the 60s, the war on poverty. Okay, right. It's really been over the course of the uh, the 20th century that that uh, with the pro the progressive kind of movement that schooling as it's it be, sort of started to grow into right. these more bureaucratic, you know, kind of, of planning, you know, we're going to plan out how this works. So what um, happened before that? So before, before, mm -hmm. before that, as you said, the, the, the school was seen as obviously very, very valuable to people, but a, a, a place where you went to learn very specific skills, reading, writing, arithmetic. And then if you were, you know, a, 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 a higher class person, you learned Greek and Latin and, you know, all those kinds of things. If you were, um, it was not seen as a place where you went to develop as a human. And there were other parts of children's lives that were, 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 were emphasized. There, I remember when I was a kid, there were adults that had only a grade six education. That's right. That's right. And part of what has also happened over the course of the last a little over 100 years is, uh, number one, um, this kind of kind of bureaucratization of schooling. Mm -hmm. um, number one, number two, making it universal and requiring making it mandatory. Right, and mandatory. Mandatory. Mm -hmm. And one of the things mm -hmm. that worries me is that around the beginning of the 20th century, there were a few states that there it wasn't mandatory. That for the states where it was, which was the majority of them, you had to start your the the or the mandatory starting age was 8 years old. Okay. For a bunch of them, seven for a bunch. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, this is children were considered to be competent at that point. They went there themselves, right? They did not get in big school buses, you know, guarded from here to there with a bunch of other kids. That wasn't what happened. They, they just went there. Um, and over the course of the 20th century, the mandatory starting age went down and down. It went from eight to seven to six. In to five, 
-hmm. And there are states now that are considering lowering the mandatory age to four. Well, they, in Canada, it's four. They call it junior kindergarten. And I find that upsetting because I, I don't think the reason I find that upsetting is I don't think it's what's best for children. And I don't no. think mm -hmm. we're, we're, we've forgotten, we're forgetting to revisit the idea to decide whether this is really what we need to do, be doing. It's right, very expensive. Right. There are other things we could be doing with that money that mm -hmm. might actually be better for children if what we are thinking about is, as we are ostensibly, at doing what we need to do to support the development of children. So, so prenatal care, better prenatal care. Canada would probably get better outcomes if they spent that, to, if they spent that same money as they are on four-year-olds going to school on improving prenatal care and supporting really um, disadvantaged younger single mothers, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, when so, what do you think is the most advantageous if you're going to be um, helping prenatal and uh, dis and disadvantaged single mothers? What is it they need? Well, you know, what they need is what anyone needs, which is to, is to first and foremost, have not feel all by all alone. Right. And that I think is become a really a terrible problem. Like the, the person, the number of young, poor women who are pregnant and have really no one in their lives to support them. That's just not sustainable for, I mean, that's just sort of no. a, a, a nightmare, right? For anybody. Right, right. And then if on top of it, you're, you're worried about uh, money, um, the levels of, of depression among that group of women are very high. People have estimated between 25 and 50%. They, I, they just, I think people just start to feel very hopeless right. and they don't see a way out Mm -hmm. And not only is that is that is that is that a men, emotional state very going to be bad for their baby when their baby is born. There's just there's there's this, but beyond just basic health care. There's nothing that is more detrimental to a baby than having a depressed mother. Right. For the still face, because when people are depressed, right. they just can't respond. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um Hmm. But now they they've 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 found that it actually that a, a maternal depression actually has a, a a negative effect on the fetus's development, hmm. um, and so the, the programs there's programs that are focused on quote prenatal care, but um, um, structured in terms of supporting the mother. Mm -hmm. Not 15, you know, the, in the States, it's like you've got like 15 minute appointment um, to kind of check on your physical health. There's a wonderful project that I think is awfully promising, um, which is group prenatal care, where they bring together, for example, so, so in the United States, they get like, their allotment, what Medi Medicaid will pay for, it's 15 minutes each, each, each person, right? Mm -hmm. So they pull together a group of eight women. And they combine their 15 minutes. So that's two hours. Mm -hmm. So you can, for the same exact money, have a group of eight women who are now in or getting support from each other. Mm -hmm. And it's led by, um, as I understand it, different kinds of professionals, nurses and, 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 and more, you know, sort of psychologically oriented people. Mm -hmm. And they are also training the, mo the mothers to take some of their own vital signs. So the entire 15 minutes isn't, isn't taken up with somebody listening to your heart and taking your blood pressure when those things can be done almost automatically now, but there's all right. kinds of machines, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so they've developed. They, there's a, an organization that is has has been spreading this idea pre, for prenatal groups and also um, postnatal groups. So mothers come with their babies, mm -hmm. and there's a well baby. Same exact idea. There's a well baby check, but instead of this, the doctor just like listening to the baby's heart and sort of you know poking its foot or whatever, and then barely looking at the mother and saying, "Well, he's you know he's fine." 
it's the same old, same exact thing. Two, two hours with, with mothers sharing their experiences. That is, mm, the, that's a great the, idea. Isn't it amazing? Mm-hmm. I just, that's a great I just idea. Love, I love you might meet so someone much. that you can talk to and exactly. Right. Yeah. So building on that and, and just, which might require more funds, more public funds. But to me, that's an area where it would be worth looking at spending them how to build on the relationships that women are developing during those those um, programs. Another huge problem is this this bifurcation between uh, obstetricians and pediatricians. And so m- women see obstetricians when they're pregnant, and then the obstetrician goes away. You never see the yeah. person again. Now you've got this pediatrician who, who isn't even seeing you. They're seeing the baby. Right. But what what people what 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 is what apparently needs to happen is to think of the mother it's a dyad that's the uh-huh. term that's used right and you treat the dyad and it's a dyad when the woman's pregnant and then it's a dyad when the after the baby's born and it's the same people it's the and same it is, and it is because does isn't it true that uh if a baby if a mother is sick the baby can and and they're nursing the baby is nursing that they can give the mother some uh, cells. I don't know exactly what the cells are to help their immunity, immune cells to help fight whatever they're because they need them to survive because they're babies. Yes, there's all kinds of wild. Huh? It, it, it is a dyad. It's a dyad that's developed over tens of thousands of years as a dyad. Yeah, and right, and so we have to think of it that way. Mm-hmm. And that dyad is disrupted by. The way our medical system is 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 um, set up, that dyad is disrupted by our society and its emphasis on, you know, working outside the yeah. home, right? And we mm-hmm. have to have, we have to increase GDP. Women have to be in the workforce, where they matter, you know. Yeah. Um, Economically matter. Yeah. Yes. That's right. And that is another, I think, very big piece of this picture that 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 both in terms of messages to women, was it messages, frankly, to parents more broadly, that people people argue that it is optimal for the baby if the if, for example, in its first year or two or three or four, the mother is home with the baby. I can imagine that's optimal if the mother wants to be home with the baby. Mm-hmm. A resentful mother is not no, helpful for babies. No, that's not so helpful. So if the mother really doesn't want to stay home with the baby, but the father really does want to stay home with the baby, that baby's best bet is that father. And that is way better than being bundled up in your little snowsuit with your giant pink backpack being dropped off at eight in the morning where you spend the entire day in a room with eight or 10 or 12 other children, your exact age and paid strangers. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that is, um, so, so if you have, so, so, but when we're, when, when the message is that the, the primary value of that adult is earning income in paid employment, that's just backwards. And, you know, one of the, one of the arguments that has just occurred to me about this is we, we had a similar issue in terms of emphasizing um, the needs of business and the economy over the well-being of children. And that was in the big fight over child labor a little over 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it used to be that children, sometimes as young as five, worked. They were poor. Chimney sweeps in in Britain. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then certainly older children, they worked. As you just said, they, they, even children who went to school, they might go to school through say fourth, fifth, sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Then they, they work. Mm -hmm. And when adults started to say, we're not sure that it makes sense for children to work. The Mm -hmm. argument was they're needed for the economy. Businesses need them. Right. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? What happened is not only did children stop working, we took them, we took in children entirely out of the work, the workforce from age five. Now, oftentimes through age 21, 24, 25. Yeah, right. 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 Years and years and years of yeah. perfectly productive people <laughs> out of the workforce 
Why? Because we've decided that it's in our long-term human capital development interests. And the fuss about parents taking one or two or three years off out of out not off but out of that paid workforce mm -hmm. just pales in comparison and the benefits are obviously huge for many children not for all children not all parents want to stay home and if they don't want to that as i said that's not going to be helpful for a baby mm -hmm. um so so that argument this just this tammy this counter argument just occurred to me a few weeks ago but i'm but it really is just absurd to say that we can't as a society make it possible for parents who want to to spend more time raising their own young children because of the economy the economy mm -hmm. has survived this enormous shock of children no longer working in it not even young adults working in it now right. it may be better actually at this point for the young adults to do more of the working and less of the just staying forever in school which is kind of yes. a separate issue but we've that's mm -hmm. how far it's gone and i think that every because i think myself I finished high school, I went off to university, took a couple of courses and then thought, yeah, no, I don't know if I want to study that. And then I worked for a year, right? mm -hmm. for a year. And then I thought, well, you know, I have to go to university. So then I, you know, put myself back in there and figured out what I wanted to study. And I went to university and put myself through that four years and, and did it. But it was a, I had to bolt my ankle to the <laughs> books really, because right. I could have easily just worked. But that's yeah. not that that's not what's valued. And and fair enough, like my parents didn't go to university, so they really wanted us right. all to go. So we all went to university. So so there's this thing, right? And one generation doesn't go and then the next generation does go. But under that, there's this whole idea that education is the way schooling, schooling, schooling. education is. I mean, of course, you know, we got to learn, but there's so many ways to learn. We used to take our kids out when we went. When they were young, if we went on a trip, we'd think, ah, oh, they're going to learn just as much with us as they are yes. in school and we can take them out. And so we did that pretty liberally when they were young uh, and it seemed okay, yeah. right? And, but, uh, but, but there's always this underthink, they should be in school. Well, that's right. And you know what's frightening about this, um, Tammy, you know, we've talked about how schooling has become more and more mandatory. Mm -hmm. Well, in Sweden, homeschooling is illegal. You're right. not even allowed to school at home. And there's a, 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 a colleague who actually attended the, the, the conference recently. Mm -hmm. um, she wants to go to a, it's an island in Africa. They have some opportunity to go there for six months. It's illegal. Sweden won't let them take their kids. So what you did with your children could be governments illegal. are making illegal. And the reason what they're saying is the, the way for your child to develop as a human is to send that child all day, every day to a building where professionals that we choose and train and pay oversee the development of that child. Mm -hmm. And there are cases where in fact, non-family professionals are hugely helpful, but the idea of structuring an entire childhood around the, around the, 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 the requirement that the primary shapers um, are non-parental government institutions, which is not what, you know, we don't really think of it that way. We don't, we don't call them non-parental government group institutions but but they are actually we could though we could, we could call. call them that <laughs> and to me that's i i actually started to think of them more that way i, I used to work in, in k-12 mm -hmm. and i didn't think of it that way then once i started working in a childhood i kind of worked backwards and i realized actually i'm kind, this idea is kind of bugging me at all levels and in fact it is parents are increasingly recognizing that it is not necessarily what's best for them and their children, the rise in homeschooling. There's a lot of stories like this out of COVID. There's a woman that I, I mm. know who I'm actually going to be interviewing on, on, on the podcast that I do that I'm very excited about. She was a, a lawyer and her older two children went to school um, 
then she happened to get pregnant. She was pregnant during COVID, had her baby during COVID. And now she's, she'll go back, I am sure, to working as a lawyer, or I guess is. But now not only is she caring for her, her youngest, she's homeschooling her two older kids. Right, because she's home anyway. Uh -huh, That's right. Uh -huh. And so the whole thing, she just like the whole center of gravity. I've heard many stories like this where the whole center of gravity just shifted from the workplace and the, the, the big school building and the child care center to home. Hmm. And some people didn't like it, but quite a few people seem to have felt like, oh, this actually just feels so much better. Not for the rest of your life, right? I mean, it, right, just, right. It's, just a, it's a relatively short period of time. Yeah, it, nothing, nothing is for the rest of your life. You know, when we were, when my kids were young and my siblings' kids were young, we went to my sister's place uh, on the farm mm. for a week in the summer. That only ha we thought, oh yeah, we'll do this like year after year after year. Yeah, we did it for a few years, and then it was done. Then it was done. It was done. The kids were older. <laughs> it was done. It was like, oh, that didn't last very long, which is what it's like. That's what life is like. Oh, it doesn't last very long, no matter what right. you do that you think you're going to do forever. So thinking that right. this home, if you did bring your kids home and you did homeschool, that it's going to last forever, it's yeah. not. They're going to actually grow up and leave, and then you can go work all you want. <laughs> right. That's exactly right. Or it might even be you homeschool them for three or four years, and then there's something about a particular right. child, and you realize... That child, there's, as you know, huge variation, inborn yeah. variation between children in mm -hmm. the kinds of environments they're going to uh, be most likely to thrive in. Yeah, right. But, you know, I don't, I think that we have, we've been told mothers that we're not educators, that, that, that we don't have what it takes to um, inspire our children to, to learn. And That's right. Right. And that and here we are, their first educators when they're born. We are the people That's that right. they look to to learn from. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I think the presence or absence of parents acting in that role has a really big effect on children. And so absolutely the 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 there there are. I think a substantial number of parents, as as I was saying, kind of at all income levels, who for one reason or another are in many cases, I think because of parenting they themselves had, are not able to 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 um, do what's needed in that role. And a crucial way of thinking about this has to be how do we help parents um fulfill that role better. There's another really effective program that, that I was just uh, speaking with someone about. There's actually a range of these, which is video coaching for parents. And what this program does is it videos parents and it kind of catches them doing it right. Mm -hmm. And then it shows, so because some parents, it's just, the, you know, the interactions are just everything, they're just flowing as they, as, as, as there's nothing really to be commenting on. But in some cases, a parent might ignore their child a lot and then occasionally interact in the way we've been talking. So what they do is they video the parent and they pull out those moments and they show the parent. Mm, that's smart. Isn't that amazing? And mm -hmm. they show the parent, the parent can see what the parents do. The parents can see how the baby's responding. Mm -hmm. And what they found is it increases parents doing that because they can Absolutely. see what they, right? Right, and they, right. And, and then that it spirals up because the more they do it, the more the baby, you know, is a partner in this. The baby wants to do it and will mm -hmm. kind of pull that out. Um, and so they've found not only that it has a positive effect on the parents, but they've actually found positive um, outcomes for children. Right. You know, even in our relationships at home with each other and with our children, when we see something that right. we like, if we reward that by noticing and and right. telling the person that we noticed and we liked it, they'll do it more. That's so right. decide what you want your relationships to be like, and you can have that, but you have to decide it's important and that you're going to pay attention.
That's exactly right. And highlighting yeah. the positive, highlighting you see how you did that, that was just wonderful. See how your baby loved that. It makes sense that that's more effective mm-hmm. than a long thing showing how you did it right that one time, but that the rest of this time it was just a disaster. Yeah. Do you see yeah. that, right? Yeah. Um, but this strength-based approach has is apparently um, m- m- much more effective And it's also a fairly low cost way of supporting parents. So what do you think about the fact that a third to a half of the state money goes towards education and that schooling goes towards schooling, schooling. sorry, schooling, (laughs) schooling, teachers and the whole, yeah. State departments of education and. Right. What are we going to do about that? It's very tough. Do you have any ideas? (laughs) Tammy, it is very tough because, um, I actually just had an opportunity last week to speak with a group of of state leaders, lieutenant governors, a couple of governors, other high level people, and they're locked into this. Mm. If you think about it, because these are elected positions, you're you know you're not emperor. You can't have you know a fifty year plan, and in the moment, good schools are of huge importance to your constituency. And so how to kind of back yourself out of this massive commitment is it's hard to see how to ha- how, how that's going to happen. We've we've been throwing good money after bad actually. Mm-hmm. This this since the the war the the um, in 1965 President Johnson described this new federal money for the public schools as the cornerstone of his war on poverty. And just a few years after that, there was the first school reform commission. And we've had school reform commission after school reform commission um, ending in the last one in, in the States was no child left behind. Right. And each and every one, says the exact same thing. I did a, a report on, on this that I'll, that I'll send you. It never worked. In other <laughs> words, from the very beginning, yeah. it's been being, there's been these, 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 these just, you know, call to arms. The idea never worked. But at each stage of this, the outcome is to put more money into it. That's just how these things work. So right? what could we do? What could we do? Is it, is it, is it homeschooling and charter schools? Is I, that I, the I way think, forward? I think what's promising is homeschooling. Um, what's promising is the money following the child and expanding the range of ways that money can be used. Mm. So mm. I actually don't know if there are, I think there may be states now where let's just say your public school spends $10,000, you know, your system place spends $10,000 on on the kid. And if you homeschool, you get that $10,000. Right. I'm not, I, I don't know if any state's doing that yet. Um, charter schools are a start. That's just a little bit better. Vouchers are even better. What's a voucher if, for? A, a voucher is you get the money, but you could use it at, at a private school, yeah, right? right? That's right. right. Charter schools are within the public system. But oh, yeah. what would really be ideal is, you know, there's nothing wrong, frankly, with, with carving. We've already carved the money out. $10,000, $15,000 per kid, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's been carved out. And if we were mm-hmm. starting from scratch, it's hard to imagine that would ever happen. But here we have it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so that's not a bad thing at all. That that money can be used for many good things. Um, and the more we can extricate the money from this vast, vast system, mm-hmm. um, teachers, principals, school bus drivers, state departments of education. It's just, it's a, it's a vast industry. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that getting the money out of that so that it is attached to the child is predictably very, very difficult because it is a zero sum game in the sense that if that money is going to the child, it's being taken away from a whole mm-hmm. lot of adults, some of whom, let's just, I mean, some of them, people need jobs, right? Yeah, School right. bus drivers need jobs. Mm-hmm. If we did, if we did this plan that I, that you know, if I were emperor and I got to do this, there would be a whole lot of unemployed school bus drivers. 
And that is a problem. I understand why they would not want that, right? Mm-hmm. And leaving, leaving teachers out of it. Mm-hmm. So there's a mm-hmm. lot of jobs that are dependent on this. And, and I, but I, I just don't under, we, we, so that is a very big problem. How we can be prioritizing maintaining adult jobs over this, the long term well being of children just doesn't really make sense to me. I don't think we can, as a society, really afford to do that. Well, that's what we're trying to do too right now. We're trying to debate and talk about this because it has to be spoken about more. And do you go around talking about this to different places? And how do, how do you spread your thoughts around? Somewhat, I, as I said, we- Except for your podcast, you have Early Matters. Yeah, Early Matters podcast. is my podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, we just launched the center- it was November 30 a year ago. Oh, yeah. So it's congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, so I've been sort of out there more. Yeah, uh, that's the, new. That's new. Yeah, it's that's new. Very exactly. Good. That's very um, good. But whether it's something I'm, I'm, whatever I can do to help, I am very happy to, to, I want to do whatever I can do. So if you or any of your listeners have ideas, I will be thrilled to hear them. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes, that's for sure. Well, I think that we've covered. Do you have anything else you want to say? I don't think so, Tammy. I've loved chatting with you. It was very nice to meet you. Yeah, very, very nice to meet you. And uh, what you're doing, I think, is really important. Like, really important. Thank you. Thank you very much. 